All right. I'm I will also close my window. <laughs> Okay, we are going to start admitting our guests. Yay. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining right on time, or at least slightly earlier. Two. All right. So we will um, give it a couple minutes and we will start right um, promptly at 1 p.m. So we just have a couple more minutes. Um, yeah, and we're just super excited. We just finished uh, a nice rehearsal with all of our speakers and I know spring, I'm, I'm super excited <laughs> for um, this discussion. Yeah, we, uh, me too. It's just, uh, we had our uh, small rehearsal a couple weeks ago but um, I couldn't really hear everyone's story that time. So I'm super excited. Yeah, and I hope that, you know, everyone who's joining us today, if you feel, you know, inspired or comfortable with sharing um, some of your experiences, I feel like, you know, sharing stories is one of the most powerful ways to, to learn from each other um, and really engage and understand each other better. So I'm really looking forward to connecting. We're just going to wait a little bit longer. Okay. I think we may give it uh, one more minute and then we will we'll get the ball rolling. Also, for those of you who are with us, um, if you wanted to, you know, share out where are you where are you joining us from, that's always a fun game to play with virtual events. Uh, we've gotten some awesome folks coming in from different places, even from out of country sometimes. So it's it's really exciting to to hear where you're from. If you want to post that in the chat box too, I will share where I'm coming from. All right, and while we are getting settled in and feel free to, yeah, give us a shout out um, where you're listening in from, uh, we will go ahead and get started so that we have enough time for uh, our program today. So I wanna, again, welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Akemi Chan Imai and I'm the program manager at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. And OECC's mission is to build vibrant communities through API arts and cultural programs that foster intergenerational and cross-cultural dialogue, collaboration, understanding, and social justice. And I'm excited to be joined today uh, by Spring Kim from the Korean Center Inc. Hey, Spring. Hi, Akimi. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Spring Kim. I'm the program director at Korean Center Inc. This event today is presented in partnership with Oakland Asian uh, Cultural Center and Korean Center Inc. KCI's mission is to serve as the central hub for Korean educational, cultural, and social services in the San Francisco Bay Area. KCI is delighted to announce the return of the in-person 
Bay Area Chuseok Festival this year at the Presidio, um, along with limited uh, virtual programs. Uh, Chuseok Festival is one of the Bay Area's largest public events, showcasing, um, promoting, and celebrating Korean culture, arts, music, and the community. More information about the Chuseok Festival will be uh, shared on the link, uh, will be found on the link that we just shared on the uh, chat box. All right, thank you so much, Spring. So now, um, before we get into the program, I did want to share a land acknowledgement. Um, though today's event is being presented in a virtual space, OECC is physically located in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we would like to acknowledge the legacy and presence of the Indigenous peoples who have and continue to steward this land. And we encourage you to use uh, the Native Land website uh, as a starting point to learn whose land you are living on. I will now share a land acknowledgement provided by Canyon Sayers Roots, a member of the Costanoan Ohlone and Chumash people. She and her mother, tribal chairwoman Anne-Marie Sayers, are involved in the preservation of Indian Canyon, providing it as a space for all indigenous people in need of land for ceremony. We are in Huchin. The first language spoken on these lands is Chochenyo. We are gathered on the traditional lands of those whom we know today as the Ohlone people. Ohlone territory spans from San Francisco, east towards Oakland and south towards Monterey. Eight language dialects exist within this territory and historically there are over 60 village sites. It is important that we recognize the original stewards of the territory. We pay our respect to elders, both past and present. We acknowledge that not only are we on their lands, but that they are still here and part of the community. There are three active community groups that have indigenous ancestry to this territory, and they are Confederated Villages of Lishan, Himeran of Ohlone, Bay Miwok and Plains Miwok, and Muekma tribe. Thank you. And now for just some housekeeping tips while I get the screen share going. Uh, we wanted to, you know, really invite all of you. Um, this is a, a group, a community effort. Uh, we would really love for you to participate with us in any way you can. Um, and also because we are, you know, sharing personal stories and we just want to make sure that it is, we cultivate a space for everyone to feel comfortable doing so. Um, we just have some uh, reminders, some tips. Um, Firstly, that you know, all of us bring in an, a unique story. So let's um, be respectful of different lived experiences and perspectives. And also, I want to encourage you all, you know, please participate in whatever way works best for you. So if you want to remain, you know, more of a listener and observer, um, if you hear something that uh, we talk about and it resonates with you and you, you're really excited, please feel free to chat, um, comment you know, reactions in the chat box. Um, and of course, uh, questions. Questions are always greatly appreciated. And we hope that today you will find um, some nugget, some interesting fact or information that resonates with you. So uh, we are gonna kick off today's program. Um, you know, as we explained in the event description, uh, we really did, wanted to design this community talk as a space to really um, expand upon some of the themes that were highlighted in the film Minari. I hope uh, some of you had a chance to watch it, um, whether it was last night with our virtual screening with A24 or um, at another occasion. So there will be some things we'll lift up um, and it's, it's not necessary for you to have watched the film, I think, to enjoy today's conversation, uh, but just be aware that there, there are probably gonna be spoilers because we will talk about how much that film was um, impactful. So we're going to start off actually first with um, introductions from myself because I'll be moderating and then we have four um, wonderful community guest speakers who will also introduce themselves after me. All right. A little bit about us, about myself. So I was born in uh, Shiga Prefecture in Japan in 1988. So um, I did immigrate technically um, before I was one year old. Uh, I grew up in Southern California in Pasadena with uh, my two parents and younger sister. 
Um, and all of our relatives still live in Japan. So we are the only nuclear family from both sides of um, my relatives that is in the US. Uh, I also wanted to quickly share um, a little bit about my, my dad's immigration story. Uh, he immigrated to the US in the mid seventies on a student visa and he attended graduate school at Houston University in Texas. Um, during his time there, he stayed with an American family that provided room and board for about two and a half years. Um, he also developed a really strong relationship and really a mentorship um, connection with one of his professors, uh, Professor Matthew O'Malley, who is um, in the top left photo with his family. Um, and he really truly um, you know, supported my father in his education um, and challenges with school. Um, they actually still remain in touch to this very day. Um, they exchange holiday cards um, and they have visited each other uh, over the years. Uh, in 1986, my parents got married in Japan after exchanging letters abroad for about five months. Um, and then shortly my mom followed uh, my father to the US. Uh, for my sister and I, um, these are some photos from me attending Japanese language school in San Fernando Valley. Um, our parents really wanted us to learn about Japanese culture and language um, to be able to communicate with our family in Japan and just to retain that cultural connection. So um, personally speaking, you know, it was not a very enjoyable experience in the moment, but um, you know, in hindsight, I was very grateful um, and appreciative of the effort they put um, into getting me and my sister into language school. And finally, this is my last slide about me. Um, all, everyone in my immediate family are all US citizens uh, with the exception of my younger sister who was born in the US, uh, we all naturalized. So um, my father naturalized, um, became a US citizen in 1988. So that's a left-hand photo. And then 24 years later, I obtained my US citizenship. Um, and we all uh, attended our ceremony at the L LA Convention Center. So that's just a little snapshot and we're really gonna try to keep um, this to uh, general introductions, but I know like when we start talking about, you know, family and story, it's just an incredible, you know, wealth of information that we wanna share. So without further ado, I did wanna invite our, the first of our four speakers, Lorraine, to start uh, telling us about yourself. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, Akemi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Lorraine Sumulong, and I am a first generation immigrant from the Philippines. I am the product of these two lovely people that you see on the screen right now, Lorenzo and Marilyn. A quick uh, romantic story to start with. They met and fell in love in the Philippines and then my mom went to grad school in LA and my dad followed her. He applied to grad school as well, uh, stuck his engagement ring in the jacket of his passport and followed my mom to LA. Uh, a year later, my grandmothers went and um, planned their wedding and they got married there. Um, then they went back to the Philippines after my sister was born. Uh, next slide, please, Akemi. And I was born and raised in the Philippines. That's me right there. Um, and uh, the, the picture in the middle is uh, me and my sister and my parents. We were on a cruise uh, around the Philippines and uh, I was elected Miss Cebu actually. Uh, Cebu is one of the islands in the Philippines. I think it's because of this glam shot of me with my bell bottom pants and my fancy shades and a hat. So as you can tell, our family kept growing. And um, uh, next slide, please, Akemi. My, uh, my family emigrated to the Philippines in, uh, uh, sorry, they emigrated from the Philippines to the uh, United States in April, 1982. So uh, we found this picture of me on the day that we left. If you're an immigrant in the 80s, you would recognize that big uh, plastic bag 
um, that has our chest x-rays. So uh, we, I just remember it being very hot because my mom made us wear these long sleeve shirts and uh, feeling very uncomfortable because we also had to wear as much of her jewelry as we had to, as we could. So um, because we were a big family, uh, my parents uh, decided to uh, have my sister, myself, and my youngest brother stay with my grandparents uh, in Indiana. Next slide, please, Akemi. My, grand, my grandfather was a doctor in this little town in Richmond. It's that red, little red square there in the map of Indiana. And uh, yeah, it's a town between Ohio and at the border of Ohio and Indiana. Uh, you know, the next mall is an hour and a half away. And the only picture I could find actually was the school picture. Uh, my sister and I went to public high school there. It was a culture shock in a lot of ways. Uh, I just felt everybody was, uh, humongous and, and giants. Uh, my, my sister was about an inch shorter than me. So I thought she was the shortest person in school and I was the second shortest. Um, people were not mean in any way, but they weren't all that friendly either. So it was just my sister and myself. Uh, we just, uh, you know, kept to ourselves. We, uh, you know, met each other for lunch. We got picked up after uh, school, uh, we went home, did our homework and watched the Waltons and Little House in the Prairie and we didn't socialize all that much. Um, uh, a year later, we were finally reunited as a family. Next slide, please, Akemi. And it was great, uh, we were all together. I have the picture of a um, raccoon here because that was another culture shock for me, I have seen, you know, raccoons in pictures and things like that, but I never saw one live. So we had a live one show up in our backyard and, you know, the San Bruno Police Department was very surprised to get a frantic call from me telling them that I had a raccoon in my backyard and what, what, what are we supposed to do with raccoons in our backyards? Uh, one thing, you know, as I, as I got older and again, watching the film, uh, I realized really, and I appreciated how hard it was for my parents to, uh, to start over. At the time we, uh, we left the Philippines, my dad was 38 and my mom was 37. Uh, my dad was already very established in his career, but he had to start over in, uh, the middle of the recessions in the early 80s in the States. So he swallowed his pride, trimmed down his resume and started at the, you know, an entry level job uh, at a bank. And as he got promoted, he just kept adding to his resume. And, you know, he, eventually he was of course very successful in his career. My mother um, was a musician. She was a harpist and a pianist and she played with the major orchestras in the Philippines whenever they asked her, but she really was a housewife. When we moved to the United States, uh, she, uh, to support the family, she went out there. She uh, went to uh, all the hotels and restaurants all over the Bay Area uh, so that they'd give her an opportunity to play there. She got an agent, she played at, ho she played at weddings and other corporate events. She taught, so I, I think she really came into her own here in the, in the States and became a stronger, you know, more powerful woman. And I don't know if she would have been as strong and as uh, powerful had we stayed in the Philippines. Um, uh, next slide, please, Akemi. Um, Akemi asked us, you know, to reflect on the movie and what to us would be uh, our minery. And to me, that's my family, both my extended family and my immediate family. I, I think, you know, being together kept us strong, made us resilient, our shared experiences, shared knowledge, shared culture, shared values, that, uh, that really kept us together and kept us strong through all the hard times. And, um, 
that's my story. I do want to end with a crazy grandmother story because um, what talk would not want to end with a crazy grandmother story uh, in, you know, in honor of Minari. My grandmother is there in the lower um, left hand uh, picture. Uh, she and my grandfather moved to California when my grandfather retired. So whenever I would accompany uh, my grandparents to the grocery store or we'd go to restaurants or doctor's appointments, my grandmother would always drag me to every able-bodied man around and say, hello, this is my granddaughter. She's a lawyer and she's single. Are you single? Uh, so in her memory, I just want to say, hello world, I'm Lorraine, I'm a lawyer, and I'm single. So if you are single yourself, thanks to Kim, that's all I have. Thank you, thank you, Lorraine. And thank you for your grandmother's story. <laughs> um, next, I did want, I'd like to move to um, our next speaker, uh, Jason Bayani. Jason, you with us? Yes, I am. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> All right, and let me get you to your first slide. Okay. All right. Well, um, <laughs> so um, these are my parents. Uh, my dad, um, my parents came, you know, my dad um, grew up in Bulacan, uh, which is about, you know, uh, maybe an hour north of uh, Manila. And uh, he came from a family of 10 children. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, had a farm and uh, for my dad, like all of his older brothers had to work the farm. He was the only boy in the family that got to go to college. Um, and so after he graduated college, he moved out, he got a job selling medical supplies in uh, Butuan City, which is in Mindanao, the, in the Southern Islands. And that's where my mother, um, that's where my mother lived. And my mother grew up in a family of eight children. Um, my dad, you know, his family, you know, struggled uh, while I was growing up. Um, but my mother came from a more middle-class family. Uh, you know, her, her father uh, worked in government, in fact, like, there's a school, we, when we last went there, there's a school that's named after him. Um, and yeah, people like, you know, people in our family like educators and, um, you know, they, they pretty much more, you know, middle-class family and my mother uh, became a nurse. And so my dad was selling medical supplies and saw her one day at the hospital and, you know, they met, uh, he went to go introduce himself there, they met and started dating and yeah, eventually got married. Um, so when they got married, uh, they had my brother, uh, Jake around 1972 and, um, they, this was about the same time that, uh, martial law was about to start being in implemented. So, um, they decided to come to the U S my, um, uncle, my mom's brother was already living in the U S and petitioned her over. But the thing was that, um, in order for them to do that she had to go first. So um, she was able to be petitioned over by uh, my uncle. And she was sponsored by a hospital in Richmond, Virginia, so to work over there. So um, she was working at this uh, um, home in Virginia uh, called uh, Mrs. Plyler's. Um, and she worked there and she also worked at the hospital. So, um, she had two jobs, was work, was by herself for, you know, a year until she was able to get my, uh, my dad and my uh, older brother over with them. Um, so after a year, they uh, you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So they lived in Richmond, Virginia for a little bit. Um, you know, my mom was, was able to meet like a lot of other like Filipino nurses there as well. And there's a lot of those folks are still friends. In fact, one of them came um, when they decided to leave Richmond to go to San Francisco, one that came with them. Um, also, uh, when my mom went over there, she actually had a family she knew because a couple of the uh, women who were in Peace Corps um, and they were living uh, in her town, actually we were from Richmond, Virginia. So she was able to come over to the States and have 
some people who, you know, we're looking after. Her. And um, yeah, so I, if we can go to the next slide. So uh, yeah, around, I think, 1975, my parents decided to move to San Francisco. So this is just a little picture of them in the U-Haul. I found photos uh, of them on the road. Um, if we go to the next slide. And uh, we moved to San Francisco. My parents, they lived right across the street from the zoo. So they had a first apartment, was right across from the zoo in San Francisco. Um, eventually, they ended up moving to Daly City. Um, and um, in San Francisco, that's where uh, I was born. And so I, you know, I can't really get it confirmed just yet. I, mean, I can't really get it confirmed, but if it seems like I was conceived on the way <laughs> to San Francisco. And yeah, so I was born in 1976. So we lived there and then we lived in Daly City. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, so. No, I'm just looking at the chats here. So um, in Delhi, we live in Delhi City, and then we decided to move in Fremont. So my mother um, got a job at Washington Hospital in Fremont, and at that time, um, at that time in Fremont, uh, they were they had built up a lot of houses because of the auto plant in the early '70s and late '60s, and um, when the auto plant decided to like cut out, they still like had all these houses. So that's how a lot of immigrant families ended up buying houses in Fremont. Um, so, you know, we were one of the first like Filipino families to live on our block in a new like neighborhood that they were building. Um, you know, there used to be a lot of farmland uh, there, like where we lived was a forest and they cut most of the forest down. Back when we were living there, um, growing up, we used to like ride our bikes all the time. And there were just like so many places to explore. Um, but eventually all that got, you know, they, all that got turned into houses as well. And if you go to Fremont, it's, it's very much urban sprawl, like, you know, suburban, um, you know, tract housing, plazas, and it's just all spread out like that. But back that back then, like you know, we we got there, yeah, in 1980. So um, you know, growing up for me in you know as as like a second generation Filipino American, um, I actually have you know in Fremont there were actually a lot of like Filipinos around in Fremont Union City and uh, a lot of that wave from 1975. Um, on or 1965 on, um, you know, a lot settled around the Bay Area, but then ended up kind of pushing out more and more. I actually talk a lot about this stuff in in uh, my last book, Locus. Uh, and I, you know, built a, I, I, I've done like a, a solo uh, theater show about this. So I thought that uh, maybe if to end this off by reading one of the poems from the book. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> When my mother comes to America, she leaves behind my father and three-year-old brother to work in a hospital in Richmond, Virginia, where the only person she knows is the Peace Corps volunteer who stayed with her family when she was a teenager. The East Coast is cold during the winter and there are no blizzards in the rainforest. The first skill a Filipino learns in America is how to find warmth. Back home, the president has consolidated his power and declared martial law. He says it's for the good of the country. The communists, he says, want to kill us. The Muslim extremists, he says, want to kill us. And only he knows what's best for these people. How do you say to your child, we'll see each other again. Just hold on. It won't be too long if you can't be certain. My mother is a woman of great faith. And great faith is never acquired with ease. Each day is a mountain and you carry the weight of distance behind you. When my father finally arrives, I imagine this was the first day he'd ever seen his own breath in the air. The day my brother learned our mother keeps all of her promises. I thought I was just a block of clay they found on a Virginia beach that they took across the whole of the country, five days on the road with nothing left to discover because every journey isn't meant to serve as an awakening of ourselves. 
We moved to San Francisco and lived next to the animals at the zoo, next to an ocean that was the only thing connecting us to home. One night, my mother opened her stomach and asked my father to place me there for safekeeping. Every day they coaxed the fires in her belly. At night, we listened to the songs of lost creatures, trying to make a home among so many living things that were far from home. I wonder what it's like to give birth to a child who will belong to another country. Who becomes the foreigner then? Which one of you is truly displaced? There's a price to knowing you're both a thing that creates and destroys just by being. And still, they will love you. And to be loved can never be painless. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Jason. That was incredible. Um, thank you. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. And I, I'm looking forward to our discussion later to expand upon. But thank you for sharing that poem. Um, for our next speaker. Oh, yeah, Jason. Oh, I didn't go to the last slide in case you all want to see. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was yeah. like my family in Fremont. And my grandmother lived with us, actually, um, too, which what a lot of Minari uh, that got those parts got me in, in Minari. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Jason. Uh, next up, uh, I want to introduce Sarah Kim Lee. Hi, Sarah. I think you're still muted, but I will add your spotlight while we. All right. Sarah, could you share a little bit about your story? Sure. Um, I came here in 1971, um, day before Halloween. So you can imagine what it's like, America, the way to start American life next day, right? You go to people's home and they give you candies. Um, so I thought America was just amazing. It just, just candy, you know. <laughs> so this is 71. I think it's a couple months after I had arrived with my dad and um, I was invited to um, a friend's um, birthday party. And you can imagine my little friend over there, little tiny girl in a red color. So that's my new friend in America because I couldn't find any, my own, a friend for my own age. Next slide. So our immigration story is slightly different. My mother came here in 1968 um, to study uh, medical, um, triage and emergency program. Uh, back in Korea, she was a uh, director of nurses in a local nursing school. And back then, um, Korea did not have emergency service or triage program. So she came to Cook County Hospital where all the uh, emer emergency you can imagine would happen. So she came uh, for three years program. And then uh, 1971, um, my dad and I came to join her for her graduation um, of her program. But then she um, decided to stay longer. She convinced my dad to say, you know, I don't think I can go back to country without a diploma. So she, and she told my dad, um, that it might be another additional two more years. So my dad, dis my dad decided to agree. And um, so my mother went to school during the daytime and worked at uh, local nursing, uh, nurse, nursing homes. And so um, growing up for the next two years, I only saw my mom sleeping. So, you know, uh, sleeping a little time that she had, and then she would be gone to um, a graveyard shift at a local nursing home. My dad, um, on the other hand, he um, studied a law in Korea. And um, so for him to get a job until, you know, um, that we go back was impossible. He, um, there were a lot of local factories, but he didn't speak the language. So therefore, um, you know, getting a job was impossible. And I think another mistake that they might have made was he put all of his um, education background on his resume. And who wants to hire, uh, you know, college graduate, a law school graduate, and then um, uh, who was a 
professor in Korea uh, to a local um, factory. So he could not find a job. And then in 1974, when my mother um, master's degree seems like it's not gonna happen any moment. So we went to uh, USCIS, I think back then it was called immigration, I think it was uh, INS or something and apply for green cards. And my mother had been a nurse and uh, back then immigration was widely open. So I think we filled out a document and a um, month later, I think we received a green card. And my dad's um, hobby in Korea was growing uh, plants, orchids, roses, and things like that. So help of a friend who um, had a nursery uh, across the street from the nursing home where my mother worked, um, gave my dad a helping hand and he opened up uh, his first flower shop in Chicago. Next slide. And so um, my mother's diploma seems like it's not gonna happen any sooner. And my dad, my mother started in, um, inviting her siblings. So first family she invited was her only brother. Um, so they came, um, and then 1978, my mother's sisters started joining, and that kind of made us, you know, feel a little bit more like uh, family, and it wasn't lonely. I mean, Thanksgiving or any type of holiday, we always felt there was only three of us, so it was um, really kind of what you call lonely, and we uh, didn't have a holiday because of that. So it felt good. Um, the area that I grew up um, was Polish, Italian, Irish, and German. So all of them were in a way minorities. And so us fitting in was not as bad. Um, so I grew up um, eating lots of Italian food, uh, Polish sausages, um, helping my German grandma make her sauerkraut. So in a way, um, I make um, amazing sauerkraut. Um, not a Korean version, but German version. Um, Italian pastas and noodles. I thought everyone made their own pastas. I didn't think that there was such a thing as a store-bought pastas. Next. Okay, so my mom finally, finally got her diploma. And so are we going back? Well, my mother says, I don't want to go back. I like where I'm doing. And my dad, by then, was pretty successful at his business. And there were so many Koreans uh, opening up the stores and businesses. And so therefore, they were sending pots of plants and things like that. So we were making lots of money. And so why go back to Korea where you're going to start you know, uh, immigration life back at home? Uh, 1979, I graduated from my high school and, you know, three of us worked really hard. My mother worked as nurse. Um, one of her um, nursing friend was a Filipino American and she told my mom, you know, my mom's uh, name is Kay. Kay, you gotta get your RN license. If, even though you go back to Korea, that's ticket to your American dream. So my mother started studying for RN. And uh, so she worked as nurse during the daytime. And then afterwards we would help in my father's flower shop. She and I uh, made all kinds of arrangements, weddings, uh, funerals, parties, bar mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, you know, any type of thing. Um, and so because of that, I was awarded with uh, my first car. I don't think my dad really knew that high school kids didn't have to have a car, but my dad didn't know. And I wasn't about to tell my dad, right? That high schoolers don't get a brand new car. Um, I got a brand new car. Next slide. So this is in 1980. Um, I don't have that many of my uh, photos because it's pretty much all in my mother's place. and. My mother, I asked my mother and my mother said she put it away so well that she couldn't find it. So this is our family here, um, three of us. Um, so looking back, my Minari 
is gochujang. So funny story is that my mother asked us to bring gochujang. Gochujang is a chili pepper paste that it's um, fermented food. And so uh, my mother had brought some with her and she told my dad that it spilled all over. So therefore that when we bring some over that we should be really careful and that it should not you know, spill over in your luggage. So my dad, um, our relative was in a, a canning business. So my dad asked um, his relative, you know, if he could help us with uh, canning some gochujang. And I think what they didn't know is since it's fermented food that it's going to explore once it goes in a high altitude, but my dad wanted to uh, bring as much as he can. So we filled it up, I think. So at Seattle, Washington, uh, at the US Custom, um, the cans were all bloated on each end and they would not let us pass through. Now, my dad did not speak that much of English. And so uh, he was saying all body language, trying to explain that it was okay. Finally, I think um, a Japanese woman came over and my dad growing up in Japanese colonial period. So his, um, actually his first language was Japanese. And so he explained to her that this is gochujang and this is okay. And so the woman and the people took a can back into the back, back of the um, office. And then a few minutes later rushed out and said, yeah, you can go take everything. So we didn't know. So I, I thought my dad spoke perfect Japanese where he explained everything and they understood him. So like to me, my dad was a hero. Little did we know, we came home, we came to Chicago and my mom wanted to have my grandmother's um, homemade gochujang. And we got a can opener and can you imagine what happened next? It exploded and we had gochujang bombs spraying all over the ceiling and all of us. So um, our gochujang is our minari because um, we were thinking of going back and I think my dad had brought 30 cans and each can that we uh, finished, it was getting closer for us to go back to Korea. So um, the gochujang is our minari. And my cultural shock was that uh, there was no, there, there weren't that many Koreans around and the people were very generous. Like I said, uh, arriving day before Halloween and going to, um, you know, trick or treating next day as an 11 year old, um, getting like literally bags and bags full of candies um, that I could eat for a whole year was a culture shock. And also another culture shock was that uh, when we, my dad bought a, a station wagon, a four station wagon, and we went on a, a, a trip and we got lost. And coming back, you know, most Korean streets were pitch black. There was no, you know, uh, street lights and things like that. Here in America, the street glowed. I mean, it looked like a Christmas light on the floor, right? It's, we didn't know that it was a reflector, but we thought, wow, you know, America has so much energies where they're putting um, electricity um, on the road was um, was a cultural shock. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Sarah. I, I have like this very vivid scene of like a room with gochujang everywhere. <laughs> thank you for sharing that story. Um, and now finally, uh, I want to invite our fourth speaker, Christine, um, to share your story. And thank you so much for waiting um, I'll add your spotlight and here we go. I don't know. Thank you so much for making me go last. Like everyone's stories have been super, super inspirational and these photos are gorgeous and it makes me really happy. Um, hi, my name is Christine. I am a second generation uh, Korean American. Um, my parents immigrated, well, my parents met in New York, but my mom, let's start with her. She immigrated from Korea in the 70s um, under the guise of 
getting her pharmaceutical license in the States and studying as Koreans, we love to study. Um, but I think she was actually trying to, you know, leave and start something new for herself. Um, in this slide, you can see my grandma and my grandpa. Uh, my grandfather was a, he was, um, he was a professor and in his younger years, he was an activist and he fought against, um, he fought against Japanese colonialism and um, and the ruralization movement. So he and his friends would run around and like teach in the countryside and help you know kids become literate in Korean because um, only Japanese was taught in school at the time. Um, and all this other stuff happened. Like they became, or my grandfather and his gang of friends became this like well known in the intelligentsia. There was like a book written about them, and there were like two movies. So like my mom always had this like kind of this eye on her. Um, and it was it was hard for her to be herself on top of, so because of all of this fame on top of being a Korean woman to begin with. Um, so she came to New York in the seventies. Um, yeah, there's grandma, grandpa, mom. I threw a picture of my cousins and myself in there because for good measure and I'm adorable. So she came to New York in the seventies and she met uh, my dad in New York and very quickly they fell in love and ran across the country to Los Angeles. Um, second slide, please. Uh, this is my family. I was born in 1985. That's me over there being adorable. Um, and for the most part, my family is pretty blended. Like my biological father is back in Korea. Um, so my dad here is my stepdad. So here's grandma, mom, and me uh, at my high school graduation and a photo of my dad and my mom at uh, the first poetry reading of mine that they came to. Um, that was a pretty cool experience. And let's see, next slide, please. Um, like, you know, like many immigrant families, uh, once my mom and dad went to Los Angeles, they started um, they started a jewelry store. Uh, they started in a swap meet. They worked really hard. Um, then they, you know, found a brick and mortar store downtown, and they kind of kept building that up. So while all of that was happening, while they were working nonstop, um, my grandma was the one that raised me. So in 1985, my grandma showed up, and how does she say it? She says, um, She says like I caught you or like I received you and I raised you. Um, and grandma was with me until 2018. Um, as you can see, my grandma too had a sick sense of style. Um, and that's me and my grandma in the nineties and me and my grandmother at my middle school graduation. Um, next slide, please. So I grew up in Koreatown in Los Angeles um, and Koreatown in LA, Koreatown LA at the time was in the, in the 80s, 90s, was the largest concentration of Korean people outside of Korea. And so it was like, and culturally it was Korea. Um, right, I think now it's really different, but then, you know, culturally it was Korea, the value systems, the, the, ways we did things the ways we had fun like everything was very korean we used to go to we used to go to like karaoke bars every day after school or karaoke rooms called durebang i don't know if other kids did that but yeah we did karaoke all the time and um but at the same time i was um i went to a an all-girls catholic middle and high school that was in a rather affluent neighborhood um and so there was this one part of my life that was, like I said, very ingrained in Korean culture. Um, and also my grandmother, because she didn't speak English, she, I learned how to speak Korean before I learned how to speak English. And then even when I started speaking English, my grandmother was just like, you're not doing that at home. So I spoke pretty fluent Korean until I, I think left home um, and, you know, language. The more you practice, the better you get at it. So when I go home now, it's kind of like this half English Korean thing, or like I'll speak to my parents in Korean, they'll respond in English and vice versa in piecemeal. Um, so sorry, back to Immaculate Heart. This is where I went to high school. That um, 
these photos of uh, me in that cheerleading outfit. I did that for like two weeks and it just, it didn't work out, but I figured it would be a really fun photo to show you guys. Um, I think that when you like live in between two cultures, right? Like there's this push and pull to, to like fit yourself into one of them. Um, and so like during the day when I was at school, here I am like, you know, cheerleading. Um, and that's my high school graduation photos or up to the top there. And we graduated at the Hollywood Bowl. Like instead of like cap and gowns, we wore these like fitted dresses. Um, we used to call it like a big wedding to Jesus. Like my high school was really old or like we had alumni like Mary Tyler Moore. I was in class with like John Wayne's granddaughter. So it was like one of those like very Los Angeles spaces. And yeah, and every day there was like a, a, a you know, you put your shoes on and your um, uniform on, you get to school and there's like a, a role you fit into or a certain amount of like assimilation that you do. Um, I included that photo of my friends down there and I, because I feel like we look very, uh, like a group of very model Asian girls. <laughs> um, and then over here is another example of that. It's my mom and her church group uh, dressed like pilgrims. I don't know what's going on there, but you know, I feel like it's it's a good uh, example of of the ways that we try to bridge cultures. Um, next slide, please. However, on like in my, it's like weird. I want to be like my Korean side, right? Um, so in my life, like otherwise, you know, I spoke Korean fluently. I ate Korean food two meals a day because, you know, you eat, you eat Korean food in school and or American food in school. And um, I grew up doing Korean traditional dance, um, drumming, um, God, since I was like eight until I left for college. Um, and I couldn't find a lot of photos of those. So like that's me down there doing the fan dance. Um, but then my mom, that's a photo of my mom doing pansori, which is a Korean like operatic. I, I, I guess it's like Korean opera. Um, and, and it's with like a single drum and, and a singer. And my parents got really into that in their later years. And so these are pictures of them doing that. My dad would drum, my mom would sing. Um, up top is a photo of my friends at church. So I think a lot of, um, a lot of, at least my friends, like a lot of families and a lot of Korean people often find community in church. I think Minadi touches on that too. Um, with my grandma, I was at church constantly. I'd, I'd be at church on Wednesday nights, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all day. You know, there'd be service, there'd be like kids stuff, there'd be meals. It was a very like family affair constantly. And um, yeah, I feel like I almost like grew up there sometimes. Um, oh yeah, and that's me over there in hanbok, which is the Korean traditional outfit that everybody here is wearing. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, kind of going back to this idea of like oscillating between two cultures, like as I got older, you know, we still, I, as I got older, um, uh, I more and more, I felt a, a need and a want to connect. Um, but let's see, let's back up a little bit. Like even in middle and high school, there was this, we still really wanted to be Korean. Like my friends and I wanted to be Korean. Like we listened to K-pop. This is when like the Backstreet Boys and like NSYNC were like really coming up. And we were like, no, we like HOT. We like Shinwa. We like, we like SES. Like we like all these acronyms um, that were, you know, boy and girl bands from like the first wave of K-pop. And there was a picture up there of uh, my friend Steph and I, we went to Korea and we met Shinhwa, which was a boy band. Um, it was a very exciting day. Um, below that is um, a photo of Gina, Stephanie, and I at a bar in Korea <laughs> and being decidedly not model Asian girls. Um, and, you know, I think that like we, there was a part of us that 
was forced to connect with our culture, right? Because like it's in the food we ate, like it's in our constant every day. It's in the plates of fruit that like my mom would chase me around with um, and still does. Um, and, you know, I feel like I, I feel like that was like a really lucky thing for us. Um, definitely growing up, it was it, it felt kind of oppressive. But I look back on it now and I'm like, I'm so glad I was put into that situation because otherwise, you know, I'm like, what else? Like, how else would have that part of my culture been so ingrained in me? Um, oh, yeah. And there. That's my uh, mom and dad hanging out after practicing um, a drum dance, a single drum. Um, I think I barreled through that, but thank you so much. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Thank you everyone um, for sharing. I'm gonna stop sharing our slide deck because we're gonna transition into the next part of our program, which is um, we would love to you know, really invite as many people, um, if you feel comfortable to start your video and want to join in, um, I want to ask all of our speakers to also do the same if you if you can. Um, and while we get ourselves situated there, uh, I I did want to also thank everyone who was able to um, you know fill out that live poll. And my apologies, I didn't make a shout out for it, but hopefully some of you caught it um, early on in the program. And I just wanted to reflect on um, how it seems like a lot, you know, the vast majority um, of people in this virtual room with us today um, have grown up with either our second or third generation. So with parents or grandparents um, who were directly direct um, immigrants to the US. So I hope that, you know, some of the, the memories and stories that you heard from our four speakers today, I hope they resonated with you a little bit. Um, you know, if you can let us know in the chat, um, if there was, you know, a particular memory or a moment um, that really stuck with you from our our speakers, and so I'm just going to spotlight us. But yeah, if you feel comfortable, I wanted to invite anyone else in the audience if you wanted to join us visually as well, because this is, you know, it as much as it is an opportunity for all of us to, you know, reminisce and share our stories. It's also an invitation to you all, like, um, to share if you'd like to as well. So. We will, um, we do have some prepared questions and we're gonna sort of um, start to share those out and foster discussion. And we definitely would love to get your your reactions. Um, Christina, a lot of people are are impressed with your photo with Xinhua. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Um, so my first question that I wanted to throw out to the group, um, starting with Lorraine is, um, you know, really going back to as, as someone who immigrated to the U.S. and you have a pretty clear, you know, recollection of that. Like, do you remember maybe in more detail, like that very first day or that, that, that first week even of arriving in the U.S.? You know, what what stands out or, you know, remains in your memory? As Jason said, the first skill we Filipinos learn is to find warmth because I do remember it was cold. I mean, it was April, it was LA, uh, but it was still cold. And, you know, for Filipinos like me, it was super cold. And uh, I do, you know, we stayed at my uncle's house. And then I think just to kind of give our give the kids a break or um, give us a little bit of a treat, we, we went to Disneyland uh, the following day. So, you know, like Sarah, I was like, yay, this is, if this is what America is like, it's going to be great. If, we can go to Disneyland every day, so get candy and get a nice treat. So that kind of eased us in. Yeah, so that's a pretty awesome first impression, like Sarah with your photo of Halloween and like, oh, America is just full of candy. <laughs> that was really great. Did anyone else um, want to share recollections or, uh, you know, for Christine or Jason, if, if your parents or grandparents had shared, you know, what was that first day? like that first moment like when they arrived here my mom oh sorry I could, sorry jason you know okay i'm gonna go um my mom would tell me that well what first when she was immigrating to america actually no let's go from new york to california she was telling me that like she had all these coats and she threw them all away because she thought she'd never need them again um and she thought that you know living in los angeles meant that she would see tom cruise at the grocery store and it was very exciting 
then she got there and that wasn't the case. Tom Cruise didn't go to Koreatown? <laughs> Apparently not, I don't know why. <laughs> oh, he's missing out. Right? <laughs> Jason, did you have something or? Yeah, no, I, just, I think for my mom, it was, you know, I mean, it was, it was pretty tough because, you know, I mean, she had to leave like her baby, you know, and, um, you know, and she was constantly working. So it, it was, and, you know, it was, yeah, I think with the weather, it was cold. Like, so like during the a winter in, in Virginia is like, yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not fun, especially for like when you've never had to be in that much cold. So, um, you know, it's one thing she's kind of, you know, remembered and stuff. But I mean, lucky she was able to make friends. And like um, the the woman she was renting from was really kind of like motherly towards her. So it was, um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, she was able to get some support. So, <laughs> but yeah. Sarah, I, I saw your mic was on. Did you want to jump in? Yes. So my mother, when she came here, remember I told you she was here for, you know, um, exchange program. And I guess advice from um, whomever told her there'll be a lot of parties. So my mother went to local um, um, design shop and she ordered all these fancy, fancy evening gowns that someone like, um, um, what is that? A, a woman in tip, a tip, a tea, afternoon at tea party at Tiffany or something that really long gloves and all that. Well, that's what she brought. And she told me that there was a party. And so she rushed home and she got fully dressed and she came back to the school and she was the only one who was dressed in evening gown where the party was, it was just the tea and some cookies and the war, the party was not the party that she had imagined, she said. So she told me that American parties are not like what we see in movies. She said the movie parties and the real life parties is, is totally different. She said, it's a lie. So she told me anytime when I said, I'm going to a party, she says, don't get overdressed. Don't get overdressed. That was her um, kind of what it call um, cultural shock, right? Yeah. So I did go to one party. I think it was um, junior ball. And guess how I went? In jeans. And guess who was other people were wearing? Evening gowns. So. My dad had a similar story when he went to grad school in UCLA, he wore a suit to his first day of school. And of course, nobody wore a suit. Everybody thought he was the professor. The professor showed up in shorts and flip flops and Hawaiian shirts. So he said he was humiliated on his first day of school. So yeah, it's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's just it's interesting, right? Because it's like, I, I think I, I hear in that sort of also, you know, what we absorb of a, of a country's culture, just looking at the media or like, you know, what the pop culture conveys about that culture and just realizing that the reality is not always, it's not always breakfast at Tiffany's <laughs> for a party. Um, I did have a side question. You don't have to answer it now, but I was wondering if your mom kept those, those gowns. <laughs> Because that, that sounded like quite an investment. Um, yes, um, <laughs> she had it. She had it until because uh, it was too expensive to throw them away. And I think they were size like two and three. I couldn't fit in. I mean, you know, I think as as 11 and 12 year old, I think I used to dress those and, and you know, pretend like I was going party in a house playing by myself. But I wish I had all of them. That would have been classic, um, really beautiful dress, but I don't know what, I don't know what happened. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to move to uh, another question, which Sarah, you did um, touch upon this with your story about the gochujang and bringing it over and in bulk um, because yeah, it was just so, such a special food um, that you could, you can't really, you know, get it or produce here. And, and I wanted to expand this to, you know, our other speakers, like did, 
did you have um, particular items that like when when your family had opportunity to visit, you know, go back to um, your home country? Was there was there a particular thing that you brought back in, in suitcases? Because that is definitely something we see in Minari, the film, right? About when grandmother comes and she brings suitcases filled with like, you know, dried fish and like a lot of ingredients. And the mother was just like, you know, oh my gosh, like, thank you. So like very, very touched um, that the ingredients were provided. So I wanted to see if there were other, you know, just particular items, foods that were brought back. I see Minha um, in the audience is saying anchovies. Anchovies, plum extract. Ooh, plum extract. Yeah, that's incredible. My yes. parents still send me things. Or my my mom is back in Korea and they still send me things. And like you can get kuchujang here, right? And you can get like kuchukaru, which is the powder, and you can get ant dried anchovies and stuff. And I'm like, I can get that here. And they're like, it's not as good. It's not as good. It's not as good. Um, and then the flip side of that, when my grandma and I would, I used to go to Korea with her every summer um, when I was a kid. And she she would have these bags, these like tall bags that zipped up like this. Um, she would call them imin kabang or like, uh, like immigration bags, right? And she would build a false floor on the bottom um, and we would go to Costco and she would like stock up on like Snickers and like, I don't know, like shampoo, like all like everything in bulk. She would pack it into these like false floors, cover it with um, cover it with cardboard and like throw a bunch of clothes on top of it. And yeah, she would be very excited about smuggling things back to Korea. Yeah, Christine, that's a really great point that there are, um, I can definitely think of some some items that my parents would you know, take back to Japan when they visit family, like nuts, um, cashews, macadamias, um, things like that. Yeah, that's that's also, you know, it, it is a reciprocal thing, right? It's not just funneling one culture's items back, but it's, you see this back and forth, so. Yeah, I, and have, a, I have a funny story. Um, so when I got married, my dad's two older sisters, um, Actually, two, one older sister and a two younger sister came to uh, attend my wedding. So the Korean traditional wedding has a lot of symbolism and meanings involved. And the, some of the things that, that are involved is chestnuts and dates. So the chestnut is symbolizes is a girl, and then a date symbolizes a boy. And that's when you bow to your um, new... Uh, parents, which is in-laws, and then they'll throw a handful of dates or handful of chestnuts to your skirt, and then you'll, you'll, whatever you catch, that's how many children you're going to have, right? So my aunties found out that it was June wedding, and there was no chestnuts and no dates here in the United States. So my oldest auntie was worried that I was going to be a childless woman. You know, I'm being an only child. And so my dad's not going to have any blood carried on, right? So she brought everything that involved in a wedding. And Chicago airport, and what happens? It gets caught. And the, the, the people said, you can't bring these things in. These are fresh items. And so... Um, there were some translators. And so my aunties and asked, you know, what are you going to do with this? Can we, you know, can we take it back? And just, no, we're going to throw them away. And my aunties went flip when she heard the word, they're going to throw them away. So what did they decide to do? Decide to eat them all. So my parents and I are waiting outside of the airport waiting for her. And the plane had landed about 40 some minutes ago and we're waiting and, and everybody's just coming out and wait, waiting and waiting. And so now we're worried that they might have not got on the plane, right? So my dad left me and my mom at the airport because back then we didn't have a cell phone. So they, he drove back home and he called Korea to find out if they had been on the plane. And um, yeah. They were on the plane, but they're not coming out. So we were waiting and waiting and waiting. About two and a half hours later, 
my three aunties coming out of the, the gate and they were very angry. They were just like very angry and nonstop, you know, saying all these bad words, you know, how horrible Americans are and they're, you know, and so one of my aunties told me, Sarah, I don't know. I don't know. You're not going to have any boys or girls because um, I couldn't bring in chestnuts and dates. Um, and so my dad asked, you know, what happened? You know, why were you detained? And so uh, my oldest auntie proudly told my dad, younger brother, guess what we did? They wouldn't let us bring it. So we sat there and ate them all and had chestnuts, dates, Korean pears, um, Korean apples, anything that it was involved in a wedding, um, they ate them and they, they took two and a half hours to eat all of them and said, yeah, that was their proud moment. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. And Jason. Yeah. Um, I mean, for us, like, you know, it's every time we go to the Philippines, like, you know, or we always send, you know, we have the, the Balik buy boxes where, you know, send just like, you know, a bunch of stuff, like make a Costco run and send like spam and like corned beef and with clothes and like other things that like, you know, maybe like someone will want, you know, like a nice pair of shoes that like my dad would send back like some of his older shoes and things for his brothers and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, we had that, you know, always going every time like one of us went, we'd have to take like a box with us and do the whole thing where we're just kind of like going to eat each person's house and we're like, this is the stuff my dad wanted to pack for you. And, you know, just kind of like bring the stuff to all the folks. And, but like on the way back was, so whenever someone brought back one thing that, cause we couldn't, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff you, you know, that I like that you can't really bring back because it's, you know, it's not gonna go through customs. So it has to be stuff that's like more tightly wrapped. Um, so the one thing that always came back, um, were like pastillas, which was like my favorite, um, because it, and it's so much better. I, I like from there, it's a lot better because it's the, it's the Carabao milk. So it's, you know, it tastes different. Like I get, you know, I try to get them out here. It's not the same, but like, you know, when I get the ones from there, it's, they're awesome. And like bring back like the, um, tamarind can this tamarind candy, um, uh, sambalo um that came back a lot and it's mostly just like you know candies choco nuts like that's <laughs> that's a like little chocolate you know thing and that that's 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 mostly just like what came back with them nice oh man i feel like i need to assemble we need to have a collective like wish list of things to bring back because they're just made better over there <laughs> um i had a i wanted to um Field another question while we still had time and this one um, first to Jason but want to welcome you know uh, reflecting upon I think this may relate a lot to you know second generation or for those of you um, uh, in the audience who've grown up with like um, immigrant parents you know Jason was there like a particular moment when you felt culturally different from your American peers like I'm thinking like whether in school or just like some kind of interaction where you're like, oh, this is a cultural, I'm, there's some, I'm different in some way. I, I mean, you know, people made that very apparent, like to me. So I like even just growing up the way, um, like the way, like the way all the, like the way all the white folks would treat me, you know, and it, it's just, like little things, you know, that you can see that or way they look at me, like, you know, and, and, and being that like, also like being like, I'm, I'm a dark skinned Filipino and like, that is an issue, like even in amongst my like, you know, in my family. So like, you know, not only I'm like, it's just like, I went out in the world, it just felt obvious, even though like there were a lot of Filipinos around, like, you know, moment that you step outside of all that you know like there are people out there that just really are intent on making you understand that you're different um and it's like sometimes it's not even like you know aggressive you know it's sometimes it's like very like well not it's not outwardly aggressive but very like passive aggressive or um you know very like underhanded ways um you know like you know eh. 
so um, I think like, you know, all I ever felt was like, like pretty much everyone I interacted in some way was just like, let me feel like, let me know that I was different. So um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, <laughs> I mean, I, I can't think of one incident. It was, it was just, it was the entire experience. Like, I think I just, I just was very aware of it um, growing up. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, like the particular scene I remember from Minari was when the kids, um, the first time visiting the church and it was, you know, uh, predominantly a white church. They were the only, not only the newcomers to the community, but also Asian, like the only Asian family. And like the kids met their counterparts, um, other white kids and were being asked, you know, how does, you know, about their language or like, why, are, why is your face shaped like that? Um, yeah, it's, it comes in a smile a lot of times. <laughs> Was there, uh, yeah, anyone else wanted to? I think, sorry, I think that um, I totally agree. And, you know, a lot of it comes in these like microaggressions or like it, under the guise of like, I don't understand. Um, but as I got older, being a woman, um, there I, I had to figure out that, you know, Asian women are fetishized. And oftentimes when I started dating, it, I at a certain point I was like, is this because I'm Asian or does this person like me? Um, and I think that's when I really started going, oh my God, like I'm different, like I'm different. Like Sally being asked out on a date is totally different than me being asked out on a date. Um, so yeah. yeah. I think related to that, and yeah, I'm seeing the audience. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing like yeah, da just daily interactions. Um, and, you know, we call it micro, we use the word, the term micro, but those things do add up. They, they don't stay micro. <laughs> um, so I wanted to add on to that question about, um, I think Christine, you really highlighted this in your introduction about like that push pull between like assimilating to American culture and then also acculturation or like really trying to not reclaim, but like reconnect um, with the the culture of your parents and gram and grandmother, and like, you know, how did your relationship to your cultural identity kind of shift? Like, you, you talked about it a little bit, but I I wanted to really highlight that. Um, I think that I never really thought about my being Korean as like my cultural identity, right? Like, it was just that was just me and uh, in my life and in my world and I would you know I'd, I'd go to church I'd go to Korean school I'd go to Muyong which is dance like and I'd also go to school like I think for a long time there was no separation and then I started getting older and when I started realizing my difference um kind of in my young adulthood I ran from it a little bit I was like you know I went to hippie college in New Mexico I was the only Korean person in New Mexico pretty much like there was I, I just, I think in trying to figure out who I was in between and probably as like a mash of these two cultures that I grew up with, um, I, I, be, I behaved in extremes. I would totally run from it. I would totally run back toward it. Um, I'd be interested in my family's histories and their stories. I'd be wanting to come home all the time or I would, you know, move to Brooklyn and decide I'm gonna be a filmmaker. Like it was this constant back and forth but uh, when I started making films, I think that's when I really started realizing that there is value in my story and, and our experiences. And that really made me kind of like start, start to dig in deeper. And I think that kind of connection to story and why it's important has kind of stayed with me until now. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I'm seeing, um, like, thank you, Rachel, for sharing how she and her other American-born Chinese friends got sent to ESL classes in a mostly white, white school. Um, and that would be a weird experience. I mean, if, if you're American-born, <laughs> um, yeah, so that, yeah, definitely, I think I can definitely relate to the, the push-pull or, like, you know, assimilating versus trying to retain or connecting back to cultural identity. Um, and I had a question. My next question then um, is, I wanted to pose it for Lorraine and Sarah to get your thoughts about like, 
looking back on your lived experiences, your your experience, you know, acclimating to U.S. culture, coming here, um, are, would do you have like a particular me message or advice that you would give to your past self, like, and that past self being like when you were newly arrived to the U.S. Is there any piece of advice or message you would have wanted to receive or like send to your past self? Okay, I'll go first. So I grew up in Chicago area where Chicago is very segregated town. It's south, south where the blacks, uh, the north where the whites. Um, and my world was my neighborhood pretty much. And my dad, uh, not knowing America and all the America we knew was out of the TV boxes. And so therefore we were very, um, what do you call paranoid in a way? And we recognized that we were different, but because we lived in minority, so-called blue color um, neighborhood, uh, you know, Polish, Irish, Italians, Germans, um, it, they were pretty much all considered, you know, not white. So they were going through racism, especially a lot of them were Catholic. They were going through a lot of racism. So they kind of embraced us. And, but I went to all girl, I mean, all white high school. I was the only one. And then my uh, next sophomore year, my best friend, Filipino American um, transferred to um, my high school. So we were like this and so we were in a tiny wor world, but everything that the information that that I see outside outside of my world will be out of TV. So it wasn't everything that um, it, what it is, right? So in a way, I like to say I lived in a bubble, or I lived in a in a um, what do you call a well, and my only world is. The whatever I looked above that little circle, not seeing the whole world. Um, I so in a way I was, I grew up in a very sheltered life, um, not from overprotecting parents, but the environment that I was in. And I like to, um, I like to say to people, explore, um, you know, go out of your horizon. Um, be adventurous in a way. And even the message today is what? Don't believe everything you see and hear in, in the TV, right? Um, so yeah, that's what I would like to say is don't believe in media. <laughs> and like my dad, my mom, you know, parties, so evening gowns. My dad, you know, thought that Americans were just killing each other. You know, he was very worried when he came to US. And my family, I think, when we went back, my families in Korea would ask us, do you guys carry a gun? You know, do you have a gun? You know, and, and my dad and, and I looked at each other like, yeah, we carry two of them, one on each side, you know, go out and go ba boom to protect ourselves type of thing. So um, yeah, be a little bit more open-minded um, and, yeah, that's that's what I like to say. I, I lived in a very um, sheltered life and I wish I would have different uh, experience. It would have been different me. Well, I would tell my past, my younger self to, um, you know, like Sarah said, just write it out, like write out every experience because every experience ends up to be a learning experience. And every experience just makes you stronger and uh, wiser. So the bad times make you wiser. The good times make you wiser. So just write out the bad times and enjoy the good times. Thank you for that. Um, we are getting to the last few minutes together. So I did want to send out one more reminder to the audience. Like if you have any um, questions, um, thank you for you know echoing and sharing your experiences. Those are really also um, incredible to, to hear from you. 
So um, I wanted to just send out one, one final question to this group. And some of you already included it in your introductions about um, what is your Minari? And I wanted to give our audience members a little more context about why we're asking that question. Um, in the film, uh, Minari or water celery is what the grandmother plants near by the riverbank. Um, and it essentially, in, in, the, in the plot, in the film, it becomes a symbol of the family's resilience. They face some challenges together. Um, and so it becomes a symbol for resilience and also symbolizes um, how the family starts to take root, start to successfully settle in and take root in this new country. So that's why, um, you know, before this, one of the homework uh, homeworks we gave to our speakers was to reflect upon, yeah, what is the Minari, um, that symbol, whether it's an item, an object, a memory, family itself, you know, that really symbolizes that spirit of resilience. Um, so I wanted to expand that and ask um, those of our speakers who, if you didn't include it in your introduction, if you wanted to, to share that out now. And I also have prepared mine if, if we wanted more content. Yeah, um, yeah I, was, I was trying to think about this one and like, I think it kind of came down to like, you know, when I think about like, just the, the house parties that we'd have, because the thing is that we didn't like, you know, there was no centralized, you know, re space for resources or like a community center that was specifically for our community. Um, so, you know, we had like house parties where like, you know, family and family friends could come together, eat and like, you know, just go and that, that was almost, that was like the community, the moving community center. And it's like, where like, you know, why, why there are like so many Filipino DJs because like, you know, they were like playing these house parties and, you know, when I was house party, kids need something to do. So they make the kids dance. And that's why there's so many, there's like, where a lot of like Filipino dancers, like, you know, kind of got like started or why they started doing these type of things, you know, and a lot of that, you know, you can talk about like how we kind of create a place for ourselves. That's, it was like a lot of that was through that. Yeah. Um. You know what's interesting like my family we're still rooting around like we've moved around a lot i've moved back and forth all over this country my mom went back to korea and so i'm thinking like what would be our unity like uh but i think for like the korean community in la like i'd mentioned like church was a big thing um much like what jason is saying it's where you know families came together it's a, you know everybody watched each other's kids it was like a, a village basically. And, you know, when somebody was sick or somebody moved homes, like, or if somebody had a wedding, like everybody at the church would show up, like invited or not carrying like boxes of like Tide. And, you know, sometimes it was annoying, but usually like what a great thing to be part of. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I... Oh yes, and thank you, Spring, for sharing. Um, yeah, that maybe some of us are still looking for our Minari. And I'll just share briefly my Minari, and maybe that's a good place to close. So this is, I, I went very literal with this. It's a bamboo chair, it's a stool. I don't know what it was built for, but this is one of the few items, you know, um, that my mom brought with her when she married and came over with my father. And, you know, I'd remember her remarking once that like, she didn't pack much, um, but this was one of the things she chose to bring over. It is in pretty good shape considering it has survived my childhood and my sisters. We've definitely used this for like playing house, I, you know, I was small enough to fit on the under, in the underside of this. So for me, it represents like, when I was thinking about Minari as like something that's co constantly been a presence. And, you know, now that I'm away, my parents are still in Pasadena, but I decided to take this stool with me because 
my mom was going to throw it out or something. And I was like, no, we have to keep this. Um, and I, you know, I, I am thinking about like, yeah, why did I decide to keep this very shabby stool and made of bamboo? And, you know, the fact that it survived so long and it's still functional, um, I think it's going on like 30 plus years old now. Um, yeah, it's something that I immediately landed on as like, yeah, this is maybe that symbol, that minari for me. So I wanted to offer that and also share Rachel in the chat was saying um, for her family, Minari is trying to propagate all of our store-bought vegetables and fruits. So yes, home gardens, home gardens are definitely lovely. Um, and yeah, I wanted to, you know, uh, respect everyone's time together and that 90 minutes is quite a long time to stay together virtually. So wanted to express all my gratitude to all of our speakers. Thank you so much for preparing you know, all of your slides and your stories. Um, I wanted to also shout out to Spring. Spring, thank you so much for, you know, partnering with us on hosting, arranging for Minari, and I'm gonna spot that you, arranging for the Minari screening yesterday and this talk today. Um, my final request to the audience is, you know, if you are inspired, um, I wanted to offer like StoryCorps might be an awesome resource if you wanted, if you were inspired to, you know, maybe dig into your, your family stories a little bit. And I hope that, you know, you find your Minari and that you find your stories and keep sharing them. Thank you so 